everybody, CT Hippo and Natalie out here on another adventure. And uh, you often hear the perspective is important. Usually it kind of is. And as you can see, it's not exactly the most exciting spot to be, but uh, let's change the perspective a little bit. We are in fact at uh, Fort Casey, one of the Endicott era forts built in 1897, completed in 1901, that uh, existed to protect the entrance of Puget Sound from enemy attack, which in those days probably meant the British as much as anything. Uh, yes. Yeah, we're still worried about the British attacking. Well, they were still pissy about that whole, you know, Revolutionary War thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so Fort Casey is one of the three forts that make it up the Triangle of Fire. Over there is Port Townsend and on that hill is Fort Warden. And then on Morristown Island over there is Fort Flagler, which I've done a series of videos on. This uh, body of water here leads down into Seattle, it's, we're on Whidbey Island and it continues to the left and uh, Morristown Indian Island on the right and the Olympic Peninsula. So Fort Casey was originally armed with uh, four of these 10-inch disappearing rifles and uh, unfortunately it was essentially obsolete the day it was built. Uh, opening in 1901, well in 1903 those Wright brothers kind of had their brilliant little idea with the airplanes and as you can see uh, this place is a little vulnerable to uh, strafing fire. Um, what is notable about this fort is this is the only one in the United States, or at least on the west coast, where some of the guns are still in place. This is uh, one of the rifles in its retracted position and then over there is one in the raised position but unfortunately it's being painted today. Which is good. Um, they probably needed it but uh, we're not going to see that one up close. These rifles along with the mortars that were once here uh, were dismounted during World War I and shipped to Europe to load on rail cars and used as mobile artillery there. After that they went to the Philippines and were used, um, the only time that these types of guns were ever used in anger was during the Japanese invasion of uh, Corregidor and uh, these guns were used in the Philippines during World War II. In the 60s these two came back here and were reinstalled and are the only ones still in existence, again, on, on the West Coast. Uh, in addition, there's a couple of the four-inch guns which were used for fending off destroyers and minesweepers, and we'll see them in a little bit. The main gun line here consists of four 10-inch disappearing rifles. The mortar pits are over there. Uh, the smaller guns on either side, there's a searchlight station that we'll see in a little bit, and these observation towers which are spaced out one for every two guns. So, let's go wander around some. We're definitely doing some nice upgrades to these. Yeah. So we are now standing in uh, one of the gun pits. These guns are called uh, disappearing rifles because when they fired, they would come back and down on these carriages and this big hydraulic accumulator here stored pressure so that once they were reloaded from this level, they would just hit a button and they'd pop back up over the parapet to fire again. Here we see the, uh, the view up the breach. Um, these are interrupted, would have been interrupted uh, thread screws. So the breach would have gone in, rotated, 15 degrees to, to lock. 
horizontal uh, swinging breech. Breech block itself is gone, would have lived on this. And then uh, the guns were fired by lanyards. You can see the, where the sighting system was up there. And also the whole carriage here could rotate. Now we're up on the carriage is where the direct vision telescope would have been. View across the gun line. This is, would have been the plotting board. Telephone box here. They're really doing some nice things with the rebuild here. These rings set into the concrete are hard points for uh, moving the guns around with block and tackle. You can see the rollers that uh, the carriage moves on. The big uh, pinion gear. The size of the carriage and its mechanism is just utterly massive. This would have been the ratchet mechanism. Uh, so when it went down, it ratchets on this and you give this lever here a swift kick and it pops back up. These mechanisms were probably for road, uh, traverse and elevation, for actually aiming the gun. These guns uh, would have been used central fire control plotting from these towers. Uh, they would triangulate the position of a target, the math would be done downstairs, and then they'd call up uh, aiming information so that the guns could be aimed even while they're in this position down below the parapet. They pop up, final sighting in, fire, pop back down for reloading. Let's do the top level first. These stanchions were for lifting not the uh, powder and shell, that had separate mechanisms, but uh, whatever light stuff you might need to bring up here would be brought up on a block and tackle and swung around to the gun. Battery worth. This was the, uh, we'll see this in the other ones, but the shell and powder handling mechanisms for gun number one. The shells would come up on those and there was a cart that went in those brackets on the floor. We rolled down into each shell weighed oh, something like 500 pounds. And then these behind these doors was where the powder bags would come up. So they would, the shell would come up from down below. We'll see the shell and powder rooms a little bit later. Uh, be loaded on the carts and then rammed by hand into the gun. So usually one shell and then one or two bags of powder, close the breech, hit the lever, pops right back up. Crossing the catwalk here to one of the observation points. Love the turn of the last century ironwork. Those uh, those observation points over there are probably from World War II, um, when uh, several newer batteries were built. Uh, Fort Eby down the coast a little bit had two 
I can't remember if they were five or six inch guns, um, along with some 12 inch ones out uh, at Nia Bay, and then also the guns at Fort Rod Hill near Victoria. Um, the World War II effort was really more of a, hey, let's look like we're doing something, as opposed to a real attempt at defending Puget Sound, since by then, airplanes could strike from hundreds of miles out, and uh, destroyers moving at 30 plus knots, large bombs would kind of make a mess of this place. Jesus. Everything's riveted to construction. Welding wouldn't come in for another 50 odd years. So by triangulating a uh, position between these two towers, you could get range to target. And that would be fed down to the fire control plotting room down below, probably in between the two sets of batteries. You can see the uh, grid pane on the wall would be used for recording firing table data. likely one of the spots where the telephones would have been. The wire went down these pipes to the control room below. I mean again, shell and powder elevators. Um, if you go over to Fort Flagler, some of these were still intact at that one. Here they've all been taken out. One thing that you notice about these facilities, they do tend to be very repetitive. They, uh, they took one design that worked and just used it over and over again and essentially just stamped out gun emplacements wherever they were. So you go to any of the forts in the system, you'll see essentially the same designs over and over. Number three gun would have gone here. Shell, powder, observation room. This is one of the, the mechanism for one of the uh, powder elevators. See the big flywheel there and the tracks that it ran up and down. And the part of the shell elevator mechanism. So it came up through and kind of got dumped onto this tray and rolled out and these would have stopped it. Mm -hmm. And then you boom, to roll it onto the cart. Right. Battery more. Coming into Battery Kingsbury. Which I believe is one of the that's not naming again. Was the either a four or a six inch battery um, designed to protect from small vessels. Slightly different design. You can see where there were three guns. There was a one set of uh, shell elevators there, and then two more here.
Let's go see what's downstairs. Oh, there's a step there. Watch your step. This would have been one of the positions for one of the four inch, three, probably three inch gun. In addition to uh, the guns, there were minefields laid out there with command detonated mines. And so these little three inch guns were to drive off any mine sleepers or landing boats that might try to come over on the field of minefield. Now we'll go down. Yep. This is a flow stone here where over 120 years now the rainwater has dissolved the concrete and it flows down the side. These little half round cutouts are for water hoses. Oh, really? I always wondered about that until we went to Flagler and some of them were still intact. Well, that one will give it a little light. Yeah, that's better. Electrical connectors in the ceiling. No, oh, really, I can walk. Goes up to the bridge and one of the observation ports. Put pause in one of the fire control plotting rooms. So we're now down at the ground level. These probably would have been shell and powder rooms. The light fixtures are a nice touch. They're really doing some neat things with this place. Little interconnects between the rooms are interesting. Gives you an idea of the thickness of the walls here. That's 30 inches, three feet. So, 
Oh, this is one of the shell elevators. Yeah, so we're looking up into it right now. It was a chain loop that came down here. And uh, they'd put the shells on this side, it would go up, comes over on the loop, and dumps out onto the tray there, and the chain comes back down empty. Mechanism come a little back in that space. One of these days we'll go over to Flagler and because they're actually intact there. Some of them are. Doors were all uh, riveted iron construction. Hard to see how thick they were originally, but probably three eighths, half inch. Picture here of the uh, loading and firing process. So there's the plotting, mm -hmm. plotting board and use powder bags, shells on their little cart. So they'd, you know, guns in the lower position. This is the direct vision telescope. We bring the shells over by hand, put them on this cart. Two or three or four guys to ram them in. You see how long the breech block yeah, is, like yeah. almost two feet. Shell goes in first. I think that's a shell they're putting in now. And then uh, powder behind it. Each gun can only shoot about 350 rounds before it wore out, so they're only actually fired once a year. <laughs> it's a people tunnel and a vehicle tunnel. It's probably one of the Fire control plotting rooms. You notice all the tubes and the would have been conduit to carry telephone wires out to batteries. The information from the towers would come in here, be plotted and sent out to the gun. Here's what they look like in the pull-up position. Built later, 1907. This is the same design that you see at Fort Whitman. The more squat, though that one's a uh, was six-inch gun. I think these were ten. Here's one of the water. Interesting how they use what it, well, whatever they could come up with on a given day. Yeah, this goes all around to the mortar pits. Yeah. Yep. Battery Trevor. Okay. Okay. So these are the no, they're actually still here too. Oh. 
So these are the little three inch guns for torpedo boats and minesweepers and landing craft. Another annoying thing is you'd like to go away. Same kind of design, interrupted screw breech, three inch rapid fire model of 1903. So by rapid fire, they mean, mean that it was uh, single piece ammunition. The shell and the powder were in one piece like a, like a rifle round would be, as opposed to separate loading where you have uh, the shell goes in and you shove the powder bag in behind it. Let's have inch and a half thick gun shields, which would stop uh, shell splinters and bullets but not anything uh, serious. One also has to wonder how much protection you got standing behind this little gun shield. The hole here in the shield is for the direct vision telescope. These tend to be fired under local control, more of a point and shoot as opposed to the remote fire control system that you see on the bigger guns. See the rifling in the what's left of the barrel here. Then hydraulic recuperator system, uh, oil-filled spring in here so that when it comes back and recoil, it pushes it back up into battery. I don't think these had automatic breaches. I don't think this has been invented yet. Where when it fires, it opens the breach and kicks the spent shell out. Um, you didn't really start seeing those until somewhat later than this. Switchboard, 1980s. This was very late in the history of this place. Wonder where you find the person with the key for that. Mm, whatever. Well, it says right there. I just don't feel like walking over there. Yeah. So these are the mortar pits. Each uh, pit would have had four 12-inch mortars, and unlike the big 10-inch guns on the main battle line, uh, mortars fire an indirect high arching uh, trajectory. They're actually ridiculously accurate, and uh, had the advantage of, because the shells were coming down vertically, they would go through the center deck armor of the ship instead of trying to pierce the, the thick side armor. Um, side armor on ships of this era could be as much as two feet thick. And so coming down through the much thinner deck armor and then the shells tend to explode below decks as opposed to blowing themselves up on the outside of the ship. So you see here the round depressions in the earth. Each one of these would have held a 12 inch mortar on a uh, carriage. And then the little shack over there was the telephone room where they would get plotting, fire control plotting information from the main plotting center. So I suspect this is very much like the one at uh, Flagler in that it probably continues all the way around.
Here's the door on the other side, which is unfortunately sealed off. But the echo is impressive. These hooks here on the wall are probably for holding the long-handled brushes that were used to clean out, clean the barrels. Um, have a, different kinds of them and then uh, swab it out and kept them nice here, nice and convenient. See the markings on the wall there. That's L E L is elevation, A Z is azimuth. And let's just reach it on the floor. Well, these kids get a bad rap, they're actually super useful tools. Oh, wait. It... Let's put it doesn't. There are a total of 16 mortars, four pits of four each in here, each with its own uh, control box. And again, same design, repeated over and over. Hmm? Is it? Oh, so it is. So saw that this is the elevation azimuth board. Okay, I see how this worked. So they would write it in here and then slide this through this gap in the wall. Oh. So the crews over there who are completely freaking deaf from mortars going off in their ears for the advent of earplugs could read the elevation azimuth corrections. Right. And then they'd wheel it back in get the information from uh, mm -hmm. the plotting room, adjust for fall of shot. This is the circuit breaker, these were fuses, old type fuses screwed into there. And then knife switches, or probably actually big fuses, the, um, the can type fuse right. for the mains. Yeah, because what what I had thought, if we you know, watch, so they're coming around here. I thought these were just uh, for wire racks, but they're the, the boards. Interesting. Yeah. Could write elevation and azimuth on here. Yeah. And then there's something in there. Let's 
appears to be open. Here above the uh, fort, later gunfire directors. This would have been the only thing sticking up above, so they were very heavily built. Though hitting something this size with the naval gun of that era would have been quite a challenge. Plotting observation rooms. This is where the telescope y direction y thingy would have gone. The name of which will come to me eventually. Thank you. 
So I'm noticing the, uh, the instrument is mounted on a plinth that goes down to the concrete, but it's actually not mounted in the So these unassuming holes in the ground here are the searchlight positions, which like everything else were well protected from enemy gunfire. What initially looks like just a railing is in fact quite the little complex. Some maintenance may be required. Just a bit. So searchlight lived in this room when not in use. Keep in mind this would have been 1900 through 1915. Electric lights were a very new thing and large searchlights had just barely been figured out so it would have been incredibly expensive. You can see the tracks on the ground, it was mounted on a carriage, came out here to a turntable and then could be pushed out here. to eliminate targets. The, uh, this room here probably contained, these were probably carbon arc lights. Good chances were communication circuits as well. I mean, there's obviously power in here, probably extra carbon electrodes for the lights. And they were reinforced up above to keep them from collapsing inward from the weight of the dirt. This is a fairly deep, narrow hole. Lifting eyes in the ceiling for doing maintenance on the lights. Canton, Canton Foundry, Canton, Ohio, December 27th, 1904, patented December 27th, So I just want to make something very clear. This is an ass. This is a hole in the ground. I do know the difference. That's a very fine ass. Specifically, this would have been uh, part of the gunfire direction system. Uh, there would have been a, a, uh, ang a bearing finder in here because what this system was designed to do was to establish the range and position of an enemy ship. And when you're doing that through triangulation, the longer the baseline, the more accurate you get. So by taking a bearing from here and a bearing from one of the uh, observation points over there, gives you a much more accurate range information. You can feed that to the plotting room. So by spacing these out as far as possible, you get the uh, most accurate 
range and bearing information and therefore best chance to actually hit something. There's a something, don't hit that. So this site kind of has it all, including a lighthouse. This is Admiralty Head Lighthouse, which uh, was built to mark the turn in towards Seattle. Um, see the oil house over there. These were lit in oil fired lanterns in the early days with a, I think this is a fourth order Fresnel lens. However, as is expressed in the comments, they screwed it up, and uh, it turned out that uh, this lighthouse wasn't visible from all the places it needed to be visible, so they built Point Wilson Lighthouse, which is over there on the Port Townsend side. Unfortunately, not everybody got the message, and uh, at least one ship tried to go to the south of Point Wilson when they switched over and ended up piled up on the rocks over there. It eventually was recovered, but uh, it took something like a year to do so. Also here is another, yet another uh, three inch gun battery, two, two um, three inch guns on a bed mount, and this is the more submerged design with the powdered shell roofs down on the ground, we saw this in Fort Ward. Once again, kind of nothing new under the sun, just repeating the same designs over and over again. ammunition anyway. Three inch single piece ammunition. That's a door. Door. another direction finder. These were short range guns and so the short baseline was adequate for hitting things up close. And my shoes untied. I guess would be the last battery on the uh, tumor here. Battery Van Horn, another three inch battery way out on the flanks. One piece shell roof.
uh, yeah, this is 